Well, thanks all. Thanks uh, everybody for coming tonight. It's uh, it's kind of a nice night. It's the first night it hadn't rained in a while, so appreciate you coming. This is the uh, it's a brain thing again, and uh, tonight's the second part of the personality disorder talk. Um, and this is actually the last talk we're going to have of this school year. Uh, the next next one we'll do will start up next school year, and it'll be in September. I'll tell you more about that uh, at the end of this talk. If you guys remember from the last uh, month, we for some of the, you guys that were here before, we talked about the different types of personality disorders and and uh, with some of them, and we left off talking about um, one of the cluster B personality disorders. Cluster B were the folks that are uh, uh, kind of wild, for lack of a better word. Um, these were the folks with borderline personality disorder and uh, antisocial personality disorder, and then tonight we're going to discuss the last one of this group, which is narcissistic personality disorder. Has anybody ever heard of narcissism? I think at some point most of us have. We always kind of scratch our heads. I used to scratch my head before I learned about this stuff and saw it in action. I scratch my head and kind of wonder what is that? You know, what are people referring to? Um, and I'll do the same thing I did last time. I'll try to give you some examples of uh, TV characters, TV shows where folks would have this. So, do you guys remember the show MASH? It's a pretty popular show, probably most of you do. Do you remember the surgeon uh, Winchester? Uh, Alan Alda's character always used to make fun of him and everything. But Winchester was kind of a, he's kind of an example of a narcissistic uh, character, a narcissistic personality disorder, maybe. So, keep him in mind, and I'll go through some of these symptoms, and you'll be able to, you'll probably be able to, to uh, relate to him with some of these things. But a narcissistic person, um, the gist of it is these folks have this need to be admired by other people. And they have this uh, sort of grandiose feeling about themselves, that they're sort of better than other people. Um, they don't have much empathy for, your, for their common man, so they don't, they don't relate much to the other person. They're very caught up in themselves. They overestimate their abilities, so the things that they can do, they think they can do everything much better than everyone else. Um, they come across kind of boastful and arrogant. Uh, so when you meet somebody like that, you know, you, these folks kind of rub you the wrong way and you kind of go away thinking, God, I really don't like that person very much. Um, so the arrogance uh, can get in the way with their relationships, of course. They, they sort of assume other people are going to see how valuable they are and how special they are. And if you don't do that, if you don't like tell them how wonderful they are or how good a job they've done or whatever else, then they sort of get upset about that sometimes. And by the same token, they they don't value what you do or what other people do very much. It's, it's mostly all about them. They're kind of preoccupied with a lot of fantasies about you know unlimited power, you know ultimate love, um, beauty, brilliance, you know things like that. Um, and they kind of compare themselves a lot of times to, to privileged or famous people, um, sort of like that they're along the same lines as those folks. And it, it, if you think about it, these folks, they tend to have a lot of, they put a lot of stock in, you know, your position in life and how, you know, you know how much power you have and all this is very important. Um, they tend to think that because they have these sort of privileged, you know, they're sort of privileged that they should only hang around with people that are privileged as well. And uh, kind of that, you know, that attitude sort of gets to people. Um, in reality, inside, their self-esteem is kind of low. I mean, if you think about it for a second, why would somebody need to put out this, this front that they're kind of better than everyone else and, and everybody should admire them and all that? Well, it's really because deep inside, maybe unconsciously, they feel small about themselves. So they project themselves to be this really important person that everybody needs to pay attention to and everything. So in a way, I sort of feel sorry for them because the, the way they behave, the reason they behave that way is really because they feel inadequate or insecure. Um, and we'll get into a second how that can uh, how that can show. There's there's some examples that uh, you guys are, can all relate to. I'm sure that I'll get into to explain. Um, as I as I mentioned or alluded to, they have a sense of entitlement. So these are folks who expect to be treated better than other folks, and and they get very upset if they're not. Um, so if they go into a doctor's office or something like that, they expect special treatment or you know appointments and seeing the doctor anytime they want. Or if they go to a, um, well, any kind of any place of business really to do business with somebody, you know, you may be waiting on them or serving them in some way, and they they really expect the red carpet treatment kind of thing. Um, they might take advantage of other people, and that's either consciously, uh, it, sometimes it's consciously, and sometimes unconsciously take advantage of other people, um, and they get kind of angry when when they're not catered to, like I mentioned. Um, 
everything's all about them. So they don't really, it's not, they don't, it's hard for them to relate on how, this, how their behavior affects other people. So they may so, say something that's very hurtful to someone, like you give an example, to, to, so, to a past girlfriend, let's say. They might say, uh, boy, now I'm in the love of a lifetime. I'm in a relationship that's a love of a lifetime, right? Not realizing that really that might hurt that other person that they used to be in a relationship with because now you're just sort of saying that relationship was meaningless, you know? They don't get it, though. See, they'll say things like that and not really understand it. Um, all of us know people like this. Uh, I'm sure you guys can think of folks like this. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, one person I was thinking of, and, and, it, and again, this is on a TV, but um, yeah. the TV show um, ER, yeah. you know that TV show, and it was a while back. Yeah. Um, but there was that doctor who, who lost his arm in that helicopter thing. Is it oh, yeah. Right? Rocket you know, Romano was his name. Romano, okay. He was a surgeon, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, and, and the other one that you gave an example of was a doctor as well. So, do you think that um, certain personality types will choose a certain profession that, that yes. would... Yes. Um, That's an excellent question. Yeah, why, in other words, are, and I'll just straight out say it, there are a lot of physicians that have this kind of personality. Um, some people refer to it as a God complex, you know. And your question is basically, do, do certain personality uh, types gravitate towards certain areas in life or certain positions, jobs, and things like that? Well, sure. If you're a physician, you sort of are treated fairly well, right? I mean, folks hold you in a, in a high esteem, and, you know, they, they uh, look up to you, and they sort of, they, so if you're kind of feeling like you're grandiose and like you need to be admired and you have a sense of entitlement, what better thing to be than somebody in life that, that gets treated that way? So if they can, then they sort of gravitate towards that position. So absolutely. And I'm not, and, I, and certainly any physician that's watching, I'm a physician obviously, and any physician that watches this uh, uh, on the TV, it's not like every physician is this way. No more than it, you know, any per, you know, no more than you can make any, any generalization about any particular group of people. You know, it's not like all men are this way, or all women are some other way, or you know, or all physicians. It's not like that. But you're right. There do tend to be a lot of folks in the medical profession like this. But you also see lawyers, politicians, right. or politicians, mm -hmm. classic <laughs> ones for for this narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. And and again, we we have to remember that um, as you were saying last week, what about the disorder rather than personality traits? Because we can have personality traits. That's not necessarily right. negative right. or harmful or negative. Right, absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up because I, I meant to say that again at the beginning of this one is that remember that the difference, for those of you that weren't here last time, the difference between a, a disorder, a personality disorder, and having traits of a personality is that the disorder interferes with your function day to day. So if you're having trouble with your jobs, keeping jobs because of your personality, or you're having trouble keeping a relationship because of it, you know, or something like that, that's, that's starting to interfere with your function. That may be a personality disorder. But all of us will have traits of these things. And when I, even, when I use my example here for a se in a second about narcissism, we're all going to sort of go, geez, I hope he's not talking about me there. Because I feel like that too sometimes, you know. But it's not. I mean, it's, it, we all have traits of these different things. And, and uh, you know, we all, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's probably more common to have, uh, when you have a personality disorder, to actually have a uh, kind of not one formal personality disorder, but have traits of many different ones that sort of add up and cause you to have a disorder. You know, we even, there's, a, there's one called personality disorder not otherwise specified. That's really what that is. So you'll see that a lot. Diagno probably it's diagnosed more than any of these individual personality disorders just because of that. Um, so just uh, some other examples of these folks, but these are excellent questions, Matt. Um, the other, uh, like I said, already, I already sort of mentioned that they're kind of arrogant and they act uh, a little bit snobbish, um, act better than other people. Um, when, when you're narcissistic and you feel sort of small inside about yourself on some level, if somebody criticizes you or some, in some way kind of, um, I don't know if insult is the right word or, or if they uh, dis, disrespect you in some way, at least in, in your mind if you're narcissistic, then that's called a narcissistic insult, okay? <clears throat> An example of that is you're driving along the road and somebody cuts you off in your car, pulls right in front of you or something like that, right? That's a, to a person, well, to any of us, this is the example I was going to use for you guys. I mean, all of us get upset about that, right? But not all of us run that person off the road or shoot them or, you know, some of the stuff you hear about the news, right? You hear, hear cases where people do that, right? Pull up alongside the guy without a gun and shoot him. Um, what would drive somebody to do that? Well, for, for, I would 
hesitate to guess here to, to say that some of those folks might have narcissistic personality disorder. So that what, what's going along in their head is, how dare that person cut me off? Do they know who I am? You know, that's that sense of entitlement, that sense of grandiosity, like, do they know who I am? Well, how could they know who you are? You know, they just drive down the interstate. They have no idea. And sometimes it might be just a little old lady or something. But, uh, but they get this huge amount of anger because it's this insult that they just, to their self-esteem. You know, it's in their heads, anyway, it's an insult to their self-esteem. Probably the person didn't mean any of it. They either weren't looking or they, maybe they were, you know, being inconsiderate. But, you know, most of us don't get so angry we kill somebody else. Some of these folks, these folks might, um, not all of them, of course, but but that would be called a narcissistic rage, the anger that they get, and the the, and the, the feeling is, a, is an insult, a narcissistic insult. Another example of this would be if anybody's ever done a been, a, been in a position of supervising other people, like in a job or something. Um, you might have some young whippersnapper that thinks he knows all the stuff, you know, and he's probably he might be narcissistic. Okay, well. You try to correct him, or you try to uh, give him some ex some examples of better, maybe better things to try, or say if you say something like, you know, hey, I got a lot of experience doing this, and maybe you should try it this way. These folks, if they're narcissistic, they're going to get pretty angry about that. They don't like that. To them, that's a criticism. That's an insult. How dare you tell me I don't know how to do my job? I can do this job better than you or anyone else. And they get all upset, and get in the boss's face, or if not, they sometimes go around behind the boss and you know, bad mouth and all that. So. That's just another example of, of how narcissistic personality can affect you. It, it, interestingly enough, about 50 to 75 percent of the of the diagnoses for narcissistic for narcissistic personality disorder are men. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it tends to be what happens. Um, it's about one percent in the general population, but if you look at psychiatric clinics, it's about two to 16 percent of folks that have this disorder. Um, it's uh, it's not there's no medicine for this for treatment. I mean it's basically just psychotherapy, and you know at the end we'll talk a little bit about how that works. But a lot of it is really gaining insight into yourself and you know, learning. Hey, I got some of these issues. Sometimes I feel small about myself inside, and you know working through that and realizing hey that's a bunch of malarkey. You know, it's any smaller than anyone else. So um, the psychotherapy or the talk therapy is really the, the only treatment that we know for that. So does that does that stuff sound like Winchester or did did you guys uh, remember that surgeon on ER? That guy that you don't remember that? He was, but he was pretty. Yeah, he kind of treated everybody else like they were one down. And he, he, that's a classic. That's a great example. Rocket Romano, I think was his name. And he got, uh, he died, I think. Helicopter, helicopter, fell. helicopter fell off the top of the building, I think, and crashed on him or something. So he, he, uh, that was after he lost his and, arm. And didn't he lose yeah, the arm by the helicopter? I think he lost his arm before, right? And then he, yeah. he was out in the, in the uh, area and then. That's been a few years ago. Um, okay, so that's the end of the cluster B stuff. Now, the cluster C, which is the third and last category, these are folks that are for, more fearful or anxious in their personalities. Um, cluster C um, includes avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, and then obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Yeah? I had a question, Dr. on the narcissism. Yeah. Is isn't it a common thing, because I've seen like with adolescents a lot when they reach a certain stage and they're really self-absorbed, like with appearance and this and that, is it very common that all, the most, or if not all adolescents, will go through a, a, a phase or a stage where they have a lot of narcissistic traits without the actual diagnosis or a disorder? Yeah, I don't know any numbers for you on that. The question was, uh, is, it, is it common for most adolescents to go through, or, or at least a lot of adolescents, to go through a stage where they have a lot of narcissistic traits? I'd say traits, yeah. I don't know what the numbers are as far as um, you know, how many or which would go into narcissistic personality disorder. I will say, in my experience, a lot of times these are folks who have had some type of um, uh, traumatic thing as a child. So maybe mistreated by a parent or parents leave or something and it's something that sort of leaves a hole in their self-esteem yeah and then they overcompensate by by you know they feel sort of um, broken I guess for lack of a better word or self -esteem, inadequate you know and maybe it's because mom or dad left early on and they were sort of left this feeling like God you know if they if they if they loved me enough if I'd have been a good enough kid and it was worth worthy of being loved like every other kid Maybe mom or dad wouldn't have left, you know. So they have that feeling like that, and then you know they kind of go into adulthood with a lot of that feeling, plus the anger, 
and it turns in, it may turn into this narcissistic personality disorder. Now that's that's sort of theory on my part, and just from but I, I don't know what other folks have treated uh, folks like this, what their uh, uh, what their experience has been, but mine has been somewhat like that. And you hate to you know you hate to make generalizations like that, but I mean these things come from somewhere. Part of it is you know we talked about last time about personality disorders coming, or you're, that you're born with a certain temperament. And so a narcissistic person might be kind of an impulsive or aggressive temperament and then have some type of tra traumatic event that occurs that then leads them to have this, you know, broken feeling about themselves, in inadequate feeling. But I don't know numbers as far as adolescence. I think, in general, adolescents do have a, a sense of entitlement, you know. Most of them, I'd say, ones I've interacted with, and even myself, when I, if I remember back to when I was. We all sort of felt, you know, kind of indestructible and, you know, self-important and, you know. So, as far as cluster C, we're going to talk about avoidant personality disorder real briefly. And the reason it's brief is because, do you remember, well, for those of you who weren't here before, we talked about uh, social phobia uh, or social anxiety disorder at one point. And, I, and there's actually been a study showing that avoidant personality is really the same thing as social phobia. These are folks that are... Um, kind of socially anxious, always worried that in, in, in a group of people, they're always worried that people are going to uh, laugh at them or they're, they're, that they're going to do something embarrassing and, and folks are going to notice uh, that people are going to negatively evaluate them in some way, you know, like, you know, like, look at so-and-so, look what he's, you know, look how weird he is, you know, stuff like that. And this is all, of course, in their head. I mean, it's more a psychological fear than, than reality, but, but that's kind of how they feel. The, the avoidant personality disorder, it sort of is what it sounds like it is. They end up avoiding a lot of things, a lot of people. So they won't be around people much. They'll avoid a lot of other things in life. And a lot of it comes from, from this anxiety. Um, the example, the best example I, I came up with, and it actually wasn't me, but that my friend came up with was, you guys remember the, the movie Breakfast Club from the 80s? Um, there was a character in there that was played by Ali Sheedy. Um, and she had really jet black hair, and she was sort of, she, you know, remember the show, they were all in detention. She was kind of withdrawn and wouldn't, you know, she always had her head down during any conflicts. She'd kind of avoid everything, you know. She wasn't right up in everybody's faces or anything like that. She was kind of the opposite. And then at the end of the show, it kind of came out that she was um, really anxious, you know, really anxious around people and such. So it's it sort of, uh, I, think, I think it's a pretty good character. I wish I could remember the character's name. Anybody remember that? I can't, it's been too long. It's been the 80s. You know, it's, but these folks are real socially inhibited. Um, they feel inadequate. Again, you're starting to see some themes here. And they're hyper, they're sort of sensitive to criticism by other people, or at least um, fearful that other people are going to do that, even if they may, even if they don't. You know. um, it's equal in men and women, and it's probably a half, like 0.5% to 1% in the uh, in the general population, although social phobia is higher, so if you can, if you think that they're the same thing, then it's it's probably a little higher than that. And treatment, actually, if if it's really similar to social phobia, there are some medication treatments for that, uh, but psychotherapy also. Remember what we talked about with anxiety: is anytime you want to treat something, you're, anytime you want to treat a fear of something, how do you do it? You expose yourself to what you're afraid of. You don't have to do it all at once, but you know. I mean, like, you don't have to, if you're socially phobic or avoidant, you wouldn't necessarily say, get up and give a speech to, you know, 100 people. That's sort of, I mean, you could do it, and it would help, but it would be pretty terrifying in the process, right? So you could slowly, gradually expose them to, to social situations, for example, and then the more they get around the, so, the stuff that they're afraid of, the social interaction, the better off they'd be, and that would sort of treat them. Okay, so that not, not too much time on that one. The next one is, uh, under cluster C, is dependent personality disorders. You may have heard of that one. And I, and I got a couple of examples. Um, some of these are better than others, but remember the show All in the Family with Archie Bunker? His wife, Edith? She was sort of dependent. And we'll talk about it in a minute, what it is. There's also, uh, do you remember the show Roseanne? Um, there was a character, and I don't remember this one, but this is my friend came up with this one, but uh, Crystal was, a, was the name of a character on that show. Do you, do you remember? Uh, so some people remember. It depends on kind of what we all watch, I guess. And then there's a new uh, new show called Scrubs that I like a lot. There's a character on there, a resident, named Elliot. She's probably not classically dependent, but certainly has some traits of that. Um, so keep those folks in mind, and we'll go through this in a second, go through these symptoms here. 
So dependent personality disorder folks, you know, they're they're kind of submissive, kind of clingy. Um, they have this, this this really this need to be taken care of by someone. Um, have a lot of trouble making decisions for themselves, even everyday decisions. Uh, they need a lot of advice and reassurance from other people to do so. Um, they're all different levels of this, by the way. So it's not, again, I mean, it's sort of back to the traits thing. You can have some of these symptoms without necessarily having all of them, and you can just have, like, dependent traits, let's say. Um, these folks are kind of passive, and they allow other people to, to make uh, decisions for them a lot of times. And some examples of things might be, I don't know if anybody knows anybody like this, but there may be some adults that, let their, that still let their parents make decisions about um, you know, where they live or what jobs they have or who, what friends they should have, things like that. These are adults now. And then by the same token, adolescents who let their parents still, still pick out their clothes for them or uh, decide how they should spend their free time and things like that. That's not, I mean, I'm not trying to criticize that. I guess what I'm just saying is that most people go through this process where they start to become independent and make some of these decisions themselves, most of these decisions themselves. And these folks have a hard time with that. They, they are so fearful of losing the support of the person they depend on that they will, you know, even if they know the person is wrong about some decision they're making, they'll go along with it just because they don't want to upset or shake or rattle that person because they're afraid they may scare them off or alienate them in some way, and then they'll be left all alone. So as you can, as you can see, they, they're sort of really petrified or scared about, the, about being alone and, being, and having to fend for themselves. So they do all kinds of things to sort of prevent that. Um, and that, that, even if it means, you know, some other harm comes to them, you know, um, they have a hard time doing things for themselves or projects, uh, starting projects for themselves as well. Um, they're, they're almost afraid to be, to look like they know what they're doing. Because if they look like they know what they're doing, the person they depend on is going to say, ah, they don't need me anymore, and they're afraid they're, you know, again, this person's going to leave their side and they're going to be on their own. So they, not saying they'll fake it or whatever, but they, um, they might have some need to not do as well as they could otherwise do. Um, and if they're with the right person, they might become enabled by that person. In other words, that person may go ahead and do everything for them, thinking that they can't do it themselves. And then a suspicious cycle, you know. Um, okay. They feel sort of helpless and alone. Uh, when alone, they feel sort of helpless and fear that they can't take care of themselves. Um, if they lose, let's say they lose the person they're depending on, let's say it's a spouse or whatever, if they lose that person, they're going to very quickly gravitate towards somebody else. That, and, and interestingly enough, this might be somebody who's really into control. So they might, this is, it's a person who's dependent, they might gravitate towards somebody in a relationship that likes to control other people. So unfortunately that's not really healthy. So a lot of times this might be women, it's very, very common to diagnose this, for this to be diagnosed with women. And they'll be in one abusive relationship, and you know, let's say they lose that person for some reason, I don't know, they may bounce right into another abusive relationship and everybody's going, why? Why would you do that? Well, it's the dependency, right? I mean, they've, they've got this need to be taken care of and this fear of being alone, so they'll go with somebody that, whoever they can find quickly, that will take care of them, and that sometimes is somebody who's not so healthy and, and somebody who actually has some trouble with feeling like they have to control other people. Um, again, they're, they're excessively worried and, and fearful that, that they're going to be left alone to care for themselves. They doubt themselves. They think of themselves as kind of stupid or uh, they belittle their own abilities. Um, they're very pessimistic about themselves. And they take criticism from somebody else as proof that they're worthless. Um, 